All right. Thank you very much, Daniel, for your kind int introduction. Um, you know, it's great to be here. And on behalf of the DHD, I really appreciate your presence here and participation here, and really hope to see you in person or virtually during the uh, age list uh, conference at Busan University of Foreign Studies in October. So before presenting my paper, I would like to uh, recognize the hard work of Professors Kang and Gary Johara for disseminating the, the information and organizing this colloquium. I believe most of you uh, uh, attended the program yesterday and, and to me, it was an excellent opportunity to learn, uh, opportunity to learn uh, various types of research in the academic fields different from my own Spanish and Latin American culture and literature. Hope uh, you can continue uh, this fruitful exchange of ideas and eventually launch a new journal of digital humanities and uh, data science. Uh, and anything else uh, sh I should add, Professor Gan. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, the DHD uh, uh, project, I would say, not yet association, but project, started with a long conversation among, uh, you know, uh, uh, Purdue University and Busan uh, University of Foreign Studies and, and others. And, uh, you know, I had a long meeting with uh, 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 Professor Kang and uh, Professor um, Yun Yong Su from the IMS, the uh, Institute for Mediterranean Studies. And uh, although we, you know, can, we continue uh, the age list conference format. However, uh, we like to organize a group uh, focus on digital humanities and data science. So, uh, you know, I know that uh, already there are a lot of experts out there uh, in digital humanities, but I think uh, like uh, presentations we uh, listened yesterday, different. Uh, parts of the uh, uh, world and then different um, academic discipline, people use uh, data analysis and, you know, uh, data visualization and so forth, which is quite useful for, uh, for uh, uh, digital humanities as well. So uh, I think, you know, it's not a new attempt, but it's a, it's a different attempt to do digital humanities. And I hope we can you know, further our collaboration in research and, and publication. Okay. Since I'm in Lima and my apartment doesn't have good Wi-Fi connection, so I asked uh, Professor Kang to uh, uh, upload my uh, PowerPoint for me. So I have to kind of orally ask them to go next page and next page and so forth. So title of my talk is uh, Visualizing the Narrative Ambiguity of uh, Don Quixote. So can you show the next slides, please? Okay, thank you. So uh, most of you know about Don Quixote, but I briefly something uh, going over. So the first part was uh, uh, published in 1605 and the second part 1615. So written by Miguel de Cervantes uh, and often considered the first modern novel of Europe also known as the most spread text after the Bible and one of the most translated books in the world. So you can imagine, you know, the uh, huge corpus of uh, secondary uh, uh, literature on uh, Don Quixote, so the, lots of critics, uh, almost uh, any, um, you know, Spanish uh, golden age uh, uh, professors that wrote at least one or more articles about Don Quixote, so it's a well-known work. Um, so um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the narrative strategy in this book. Next slides, please. A little bit of something quickly about, uh, um, you know, Miguel de Cervantes biography. Uh, was born in Alcalá Henares, Spain, and then uh, his youth, he lived in Córdoba and uh, Sevilla. Um, there's a talk that uh, his mother was a uh, converso uh, woman, uh, 
maybe also his his father or grandfather also uh, has some uh, converso uh, um, influence or context or heritage. Right? And then 1566 through 1580, uh, he moved to Madrid and then traveled to Italy and there served in military and participated in the War of Lepanto, one of the most important uh, events of uh, his life. And then uh, there he was captured and enslaved by Ottoman Corsair. So he suffered, I think he was in captivity for about five years. And then finally uh, the, his ransom was paid and he was freed in 1580. And then returned to Madrid and trying to, you know, uh, work in various places, but didn't work. So he decided to move to, uh, you know, New World. And he got the permission, but uh, some something happened. So he didn't move to uh, uh, Latin America. And then 1587 to 1600, uh, he stayed in Se Sevilla, which was very important uh, experience. And you, we can see uh, uh, the, his experience in Sevilla really uh, 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 can be visible and uh, well uh, uh, documented in, in his works. And then he moved to Valladolid in 1604. And in uh, a year later, he published the first part of Don Quixote. And then 1615, he published the second part and he died in 1616. So next page, please. So the basic structure of Don Quixote, the, the first part has, uh, has 52 chapters and, and part two has 74 chapters. Of, uh, and uh, actually um, the, the reading of uh, part one is, can be quite different pro, from part two. So part one is sort of, uh, experimental and more uh, different um, genre, uh, so poetry, uh, intercalated uh, uh, short stories, and other uh, uh, even some theatrical scenes there. But part two has a little bit more, I would say, unity and some con uh, continuity in narrative. So uh, part two is uh, is quite different from part one. But both of these uh, parts, of course, the, a lot of people talk about Don Quixote. I mean, uh, those in the uh, Anglo Anglophone uh, world is uh, the windmill uh, incident was, is always talked about it and you know uh, um, depicted many times. But actually, uh, the second uh, whole book is about how to write. A novel, so whole whole throughout the, all these chapters, you know, he really uh, Cervantes really uh, kind of questions and and try to figure out how to write a novel. So it is quite uh, interesting to see he's coming up with a sort of new uh, genre or new narrative uh, uh, genre, and then he really struggled how to write it. So in that sense, a lot of you know. Uh, uh, postmodern uh, critics uh, praise about this attempt. So it's sort of like self, uh, writer's self-reflection on what he or she's doing. That's, uh, you know, very kind of avant-garde if you consider this, this uh, work was written in the beginning of 17th century. So um, the superficial structure of the uh, 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 Don Quixote narration is uh, from Chapter one to chapter eight of part one, it says uh, it, that those uh, chapters were taken from the archives of La Mancha. That's the you know, archive there that the, the main narrator talks about. And then chapter nine, uh, when uh, uh, the narrator travel to Toledo and there where he finds uh, this uh, Arabic manuscript and uh, uh, written by Sid Hamete Penangeli. And then, and then um, you know, the main narrator asked uh, this uh, Al Hamiado, the uh, Arabic person who can read and uh, the, read and translate the work. And then uh, 
has to translate. So from chapter nine on, whole, all the chapters were supposedly from Sayyid uh, Hamet uh, uh, Ben text. And so he's sort of like whole text is rewriting and or correcting or uh, amend, uh, the fixing, uh, uh, you know, uh, what was already written by Sid uh, Khametebe and Heli. So it has very much postmodern nature to uh, uh, the text. So it's a, not, writing is actually rewriting. Writing is not just writing for the first time. Writing is always uh, rewriting. So that uh, sense of uh, 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 kind of correction and questioning is always uh, presented in, in the work. Next slide, please. Oh, you can move to next slide. So I just, I thought it was just putting all the narratives boring. So I put some uh, images. So, okay. So types of narratives, uh, narrative voices in Don Quixote. So uh, I can uh, divide into three types. So first one is the enunciative identity entity that Miguel de Cervantes constitutes as the, the true author. Second, the voice uh, that represents the narrator of Don Quixote, the main narrator. And then three, the set of fictitious authors. So each one I'll talk about a little bit in detail. So uh, next slides, please. And next one, please. Thank you. So, uh, the first uh, 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 nar narrative voice, so as, a, as the real author, Miguel de Cervantes, you know, appears on the cover and only makes the dedication to the Duke of Bejar, you know, after which he already la launches the fictional speech. So in contrast, in the second part of Don Quixote, Cervantes as the real author meddles in the prologue to the reader which precedes the dedication to the Duke of Lemos and uh, refutes Avellaneda's authority over Don Quixote. So Avellaneda here, the most of you know, who, who studied the Spanish literature, is, is a, a sequel, an official sequel of Don Quixote after the first uh, part was published and it was so popular. So there are a lot of uh, authors attempts to write this sequels because uh, Cervantes didn't think about writing the second part for some time. So then it became really popular so that Cervantes decided to write the second part. So the talk is that in the second part, he purposely killed, <laughs> well, he made uh, Don Quixote died in the second part so that, that there won't be any more uh, sequels, but actually that was not the case. And after the second part was published, though, of course, until I think, 18th, 19th century uh, in Spain and elsewhere, people wrote um, uh, sequels of Don Quixote. Next slide, please. Thank you. Next one, please. And then second uh, narrator, um, Don Quixote, uh, uh, is the, the main um, narrator in an anonymous voice who controls the entire text and discursive systems. So I, I thought, you know, it's a little bit more philosophical way to think about it. Perhaps this, you know, uh, narrator needs to be distinguished since its entity is not the representative or collective constitution of implicit narrators who are actually quoted or mentioned in a, a direct, uh, in, indirect discourse. So. Uh, mo most uh, literature students here or, or experts here are familiar with, with the Bakhtin's, you know, polyphony. So this is so, sort of like adapting, uh, thinking about Bakhtin's uh, polyphony. And I thought about there are, it, this main character is not just a main character, but there are many other voices unidentified, but somehow we kind of assume that that's the voice of the, this main narrator, but we, we can split down that, you know, even some of some parts, some of the narrators can uh, be different from this main narrator, but, you know, that's uh, another matter that we need to study uh, later. So next slide, please. 
Next slides. Yeah, and the, the last group, the set of fictitious authors. So this group, the, the fictional authors uh, can be classified into following subdivision. First one, the prologue writer, the first part of Don Quixote. Second, the unknown narrator of chapter one to eight of the first part. And the third, see the Hamete Benekeli. That's the one I'm going to focus on this uh, work. And then fourth, uh, the Moorish al Hamiado as the anonymous uh, translator of the manuscripts from Arabic to Spanish. He, this character never appears as a voice, but there, there is implicit you know, uh, uh, mentions of how the translation was good, translation was or incorrect, and so forth. And the fifth, uh, the last part, the academics of the Ar uh, Arga Marci Marcija, the authors of the verses given to the main narrator, the last part of, uh, last uh, section of part one of Don Quixote, uh, chapter 52, okay. Next slides, please. Now I'm gonna talk about a little bit of the Sid Hamete Ben uh, Next slide, please. So Sid Hamete Ben is a fictional character and narrator who, uh, according to the principal narrator, wrote the original verse, uh, version of Don Quixote in Arabic. Sid Hamete Ben is mentioned 41 times in the first and the second book of Don Quixote. A little bit later, uh, I will show you the, uh, the chart of the distribution of these uh, uh, 41, uh, uh, 41 appearances of Fasid. Uh, sorry. And all of those who find uh, pleasure in histories like this ought to show their gratitude to see the Hamid Ben Heli, its original author, uh, for the scrupulous care he has taken to set before us all its minute particulars and not leaving any, anything, however trifling it may be, that he does not make clear and plain. This is a direct quote from Chapter nine, this is a, the part that the main uh, narrator uh, talk, uh, introduced uh, Sid Khamete Ben Akhili. Next uh, slide, please. Next one, please. So um, later he was described, the Sid Khamete Ben Akhili was described as a historian of a great research and accuracy in all things. And as the Arab and Manchegan, so the Manchego, so the original title of Don Quixote is Don Quixote de la Mancha, the, the uh, middle part of uh, Spain uh, called La Mancha. So the Arabic and the Manchegan author relates in this most grave and high sounding, minute, delightful and original history. Uh, part one, uh, chapter 22. And very often words of Sid Hamet Ben Heli are found verbatim, literally or in quotation marks. Likewise, the, uh, the, this Arabic uh, narrator is an important uh, character in his own novel. He speaks and others speak, speak of him and as happened with other characters. And then Howard Mansing interprets this narr narrative in intervention and uses the concept of met metafictional dialectics to expose the un unusual Cervantine interaction and intertextuality between Sida Hamed Ben Akhali and the rest of the fictional narrator. So, uh, in other words, uh, you know, some of, uh, among the 41 times uh, of the uh, Sida Hamed Ben Akhali is mentioned. Uh, sometimes the main narrator says, uh, this is what, you know, Sid Hamete Ben Akhali says, and it continues. And, or, or sometimes as simple as Sid Hamete Ben Akhali adds or says or relates uh, that. But uh, other, other, few other occasions, he actually, you know, uh, 
kind of uh, think about, imagine how Sid Hamate Ben Kelly was, and even uh, Sancho and Don Quixote has debate about Sid, Sid Hamate Ben Kelly. And the main, main uh, narrator uh, once or twice says, uh, see the Hamete Ben Angeli was wrong. He didn't say this, so you know he's gonna correct. And one part, I forgot the exact chapter. I'm gonna list it when I write an article on this. But uh, you know, specific uh, that chapter, he says, uh, see the Hamete Ben Angeli skip this part, or this part was not translated. So that's why the main character interrupts and uh, he talks about what uh, was not translated. So, and next uh, slides, please. Next one, please. So, I give when I give a talk in uh, uh, Busan uh, uh, Foreign uh, in Busan University of Foreign uh, Studies, uh, I talked about a little bit about um, uh, possibility of uh, makama, the Arabic uh, novel tradition. Uh, in uh, Don Quixote. So Makama was, uh, was an Arabic novel where you can see a narrator like a, a Picaro, a Picaresque figure, or always uh, someone who lies or, or, or a criminal type of character. And, but he, he tells a story of how to cheat people, how to take advantage of people. And then he kind of carries uh, all narrative of story that way. So. Perhaps, uh, you know, um, yeah. my suggestion might be, you know, uh, that, that Sid Hamete Ben Angeli character is kind of came from that kind of Makama uh, uh, narrative tradition. Okay, so just conclusion is that Sid Hamete Ben Angeli entangles and breaks and dilates and disrupts authorial uh, authority and unity. Consequently, Cervantes is gradually displaced in his own novel, which becomes more obvious, particularly in the second part of Don Quixote. The presence of Sid Hamete Ben Angeli effectively facilitates the, the vast polyphonic and pragmatic possibilities in Cervantes' discourse. So using you know, uh, Sid Hamete Ben Angeli character, the, uh, he, I think uh, you know, Cervantes could use uh, Many different voices, uh, narrative voices in there, and and even he uh, Cervantes makes uh, see the Hamete Ben Angeli text itself is sort of like very polyphonic already. So it's a polyphony of polyphonies, I guess. Okay, and the next I'm just to show the uh, all the um, the data is a little bit uh, very rud rudimentary data of these. Uh, next slides, please. So just a uh, quick uh, graph about, you know, um, uh, in part one, uh, uh, I don't know why it, it's uh, changed here, but part, this is a small one is a part one that that's only out of, uh, out of 41 times, you only see five times uh, Sid Hamete Ben Angelo is mentioned in the part one and then part two you can see about uh, 36 times uh, uh, Sid Hamete Ben Angelo's name was mentioned in part two. Next slide please. And then this is just a distribution of different chapters. So from chapter of part one, chapter one through ten, only uh, one chapter uh, was in one chapter, Sid Hamete Ben Angeli's name was mentioned, and then chapter 10, 11 through 20, you can see so forth. And then if you see uh, chapter 31 till the, so it's not like exactly half, but about after two thirds of the book, uh, you don't see Sid Hamete Ben Angeli's name anymore in the first part. But it, when you see the second part, uh, his name is almost, consistently mentioned except uh, chapter 11 through 20. And then towards the end, the chapter uh, uh, 41 and on, he see the Khamet Ben Angeli was constantly mentioned, and especially the last uh, last 24 chapters, the chapter 51 through 74, uh, 
uh, he, you see the Chameteh Ben Ekeli keep, uh, was, uh, keep appearing there and mentioned, not just uh, he said, you know, he said he becomes almost like character in these uh, later parts of uh, part two. So that I have last slides, uh, next, next slides, please. Thank you. So this is just comparison. So the, uh, the orange one is number of mentions. So it's one chapter in part one, chapter one through 10, one chapter includes see the Chameta Ben Angel is mentioned in one year once. And then if you see the chart on the part two, uh, part two, chapter one through 10, you can see he's uh, all, only four chapters uh, include his names, but his name was mentioned actually five times and so forth. So, so if you read, see the last part, chapter, uh, part two, chapter 61 through 74, uh, six chapters include his names, but then uh, his name was mentioned 12 times. So it, it becomes more and more in, uh, increasing in how when, uh, you know, uh, Cervantes tried to end the novel, he really kind of, not struggle, but keep reminding people that uh, this uh, was the, uh, the fictional text of Sidi Hamet Ben Ekeli, and and then he's just rewriting. So it's sort of like you know he's inventing a, a fiction of fiction. So thank you very much. That's that's the conclusion of my talk. Thank you so much, uh, Professor No. And now we have around 20 minutes for our, our Q and question and answer session. Please, if you have comments or questions. Uh, I, I uh, okay, uh, Polly, please uh, go ahead. Hello, I'm sorry, I'm, I turned off my video because I'm having connectivity issues, but um, I, I was very fascinated by this conversation. I love Don Quixote and um, Okay, I think I lost her. So can you hear her? Anybody can hear her? Oh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to hold on. Uh, I was wondering if this is like more of a question of expertise. So I was wondering if you considered when the narrator and I'm trying to remember which narrator now and I can't recall questions the actual history of the thing. So like when they say, well, it was Quixote or Quesada or Quijada or whatever they say, where does that fit? What does that voice fit in with your analysis? That was the first part. And then the second part is, do you think that like Avellaneda's like fake kind of um, continuation of Quixote um, propelled or like motivated Cervantes to insist on this fictitious writer even more? Like, do you think it made him think about voice or what, what is your reasoning for why he kept, he, why he, that he seems to have, it's like, um, that he relied more on Sida Amete but in Kelly at the towards the end of the text. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question. Yeah, good question. I think uh, let me answer your question uh, a little bit circumventing way because uh, I think the whole notion of truth matters in in this text in this novel. So. He's sort of trying to, you know, avoid any type of dogmatic thoughts. I think he just uh, he trying to question almost everything, and and that all things can be um, uh, uh, con contextualized, and then and all, all things can be looked from different perspectives, and then truth is somewhere out there. It's not that. There's no truth, but truth it's not like totally radical postmodern ideas like tr uh, you know, truth is totally relative or, or subjective. Uh, it's, it's not like that, but I think he's, he, there's some truth, but the truth should be um, considered um, uh, uh, 
more complex way. You know, your truth, you, your truth and my truth can be different, but there's some truth out there. So the, the, let's look at it, different uh, perspectives or different uh, context of, of this. And, then, and that's why I think he always put many different uh, uh, voices and he, he tried to make the fiction of fiction. And he, I think that that's his way of looking at how to write a novel. It's not like uh, telling a, 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 like a you know, story and then anything can be questions and, and anything can be uh, not mistrust, but you know, any, any authority can be questioned. So anything is, is not as kind of set down in stone as they look. So anything can be, you know, uh, malleable or, or, or questionable. So the first part you asked me, uh, the, you know, the, some parts that he, even the narrator says something and there's someone, uh, the other voice said, maybe but that's not true. And they kind of contradicts. Uh, so where, where the voice come from? So that's the part, I think most of them, I mean, if we break down to each, you know, the, the, each level of uh, uh, narrative uh, strategy, then it's really, uh, can be really complicated. And uh, I think and some studies should have, should be done about it, but uh, that, that's the part I put as a second group, uh, the main character, and that this main character as some sort of kind of, um, uh, collective voice of all different uh, anonymous voices. Uh, I would put it put it there because uh, third group is uh, the group of fictional uh, narrators. So those fictional narrators, some sort of uh, specific uh, reference or names. So I would put that in the second group. But you know, the very good question. And then uh, your second question was. Uh, I, um, Second question, I, I forgot. Uh, um, the second, <laughs> thank you. No, no, thank you so much. I, I now want to take Quixote again. <laughs> um, the class, I mean. Uh, the second <laughs> question was, do you think that, you know, that Cervantes is like realization that someone could write a sequel to Quixote mm -hmm. because of Avellaneda that made him like mm -hmm. almost like more extreme in his insistence mm -hmm. that this is a text that's like, you know, has a, I don't know, has a, has a voice or characters of its mm -hmm. own and that, you know, like, why do you think he increased, he, st he relied more heavily on Fide Amete Ben and Kelly towards the end of the mm -hmm. time? Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Thank you very much for your question. So I, I think uh, Luz Lopez Baral, she, she talks about how Fide uh, Amete Ben and Kelly is uh, kind of one of the important character there because uh, it kind of shows uh, Cervantes' understanding of Islamic culture, and especially he was uh, in captivity for five years in, in Turkey and other part uh, of, of uh, Arabic words. He must have learned about Quran and then must have learned about Islamic uh, beliefs. So some of the things he, of course, outright, uh, you know, racist or, or you know, uh, blasphemous uh, 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 comments of Cervantes you can see against, especially against uh, Islam and, and, and Allah. But at the same time, there's a other type of, uh, you know, kind of comments kind of show that, yeah, I mean, you know, Christians are not, not, not better than Islam's and, you know, all religion have this kind of dogmatic and some kind of very suggestive, you know, or comments there uh, that, I think that that's what Luz uh, Lopez Barral talked talked about, um, and so I think that's uh, using uh, you know Sid Hamete Ben Kelly in the second part. I think he's trying to really show that kind of uh, trying to undo the authoritarian uh, uh, belief of Christianity, and they kind of uh, trying to put more uh, kind of question. Uh, um, ask his readers to question authorities and, and question about this kind of, you know, Spain, uh, uh, this Catholic ideology as a uh, political ideology and all this. And there's some, some sort of suggestion there. And then also 
other things that you just you just mentioned that what about sequels yes i think i remember anthony cascardi when he when he mentioned about this he he, he said you know uh, the main thing main theme of the uh, don quixote one of the main themes of don quixote would be kind of uh, stop the popularity of chivalric novels because you know it, it's it's a absurd and it's a you know to believe in one uh, hero who could save the world and all this can be done so he's actually one of the you know main purpose of uh, Cervantes was writing against the chivalric novel so I think if you look at it that way then maybe Sid Hamete Benengeli's character would be kind of totally an unorthodox character to such a uh, uh, chivalric genre because the chivalric genre is about like Christian Christian heroes uh, going against uh, Saracens or, or uh, Moor, Moorish people and that they conquer and they you know do this so but you know actually these novel is originally written in Arabic by Arabic writer then it questions the whole you know genre of uh, of uh, chivalric novel in some ways. So on, on purpose, he might have done that. Of course, as you and I know, um, you know, after even the second part was published, uh, the chivalric novel popularity went on, just like these days, Netflix, you know, how can you stop Netflix? So, <laughs> so, so sort of like that. So I, I think that that would be, you know, uh, his attempts purposely, purposely Reminding people of the, the existence of Sid Hamete Benengeli. Maybe you can see, you know, Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra as a, as a author name in the front page, but there are many other voices you can find in this text. Therefore, you know, whoever trying to ride on the popularity of chivalric novel, they are kind of archaic and they're wrong. I think that's maybe that might be the. Uh, Cervantes' response to to the sequels. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. And I, I have another question that is related to the charts that you designed. Mm -hmm. uh, we can see. Oh, first we know that the first part and the second part are very different, totally different. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it, it seems like books written by a different by different authors mm -hmm. uh, and in the chart we can see that uh Sid Hamet Medengeli is more important in the second part mm -hmm. probably because yeah, mm -hmm. we, see, we see numbers we see that he appears more uh, for this reason we can think think that he's more important do you think that this this number that is uh greatest importance influence the structure of the second part so there is a relation between Sikhan and Betengeli appears more it means we have a different structure for the second part oh most most, most definitely that uh, Daniel uh, I, you know I perfectly agree with you on that so in the first first part as you can see you know we, we talked about in class in the first first uh, eight chapters sort of like experiment he, he writes and, they, and they, people talk about it, how that part reads quite differently even the first you know, first eight uh, part, uh, chapters because he didn't have a Sancho he didn't have just uh, you know the narrator main narrator keep talks about things and then you know there's no no dialogue and it's not uh, as Bakhtin says it's not, it's not a dialogic novel dialogic novel uh, comes much later so it's quite different. And then surprisingly, then right after chapter eight, chapter nine, uh, chapter, eight chapter nine, he brings out the Sid Hamet de Benengeli to as a, you know, kind of character to uh, change the whole sort of like essence of the, uh, of Don Quixote. Like, you know, all the, you know, this writer says, no, I didn't write this. I actually got this, uh, you know, novel from somewhere else and I'm sort of like, you know, changing, but then he, I think he didn't know what to do about that. So that's why he's, uh, he was only mentioned chapter nine, chapter 15, 16, and then chapter 22 and 27. And there his names were mentioned in chapter 22 and chapter 27. He just said, this is what uh, you know, the Sid Hamete Benengeli continues 
or he's, he narrates. So he, he kind of throws that, throws that, and then, and then after chapter 27, we totally forget about see the Khamet de Benekeli. And then, as you mentioned, chapter uh, part two, very first chapter, he says in the very first line of the chapter one of part two said, this is what see the Khamet de Benekeli wrote. So that's, that's like he's kind of realized ah, after the first chapter, the first part, then he realized, oh, I got to rewrite this. And that, you know, and considering, I think there's, uh, I think I always, I think there's some question uh, of uh, Holy's question uh, hovering around here too. So maybe the total context is, you know, after the other sequels came out and then, and on purpose the second part of uh, uh, chapter one of second part starts like that with a, with the Sid Hamid the Ben Kelly means means a lot and then definitely we have to uh, uh, kind of read kind of uh, analyze carefully the Sid Hamid the Ben Kelly's function in the chap, chap part two and I promise I, I, I'll do that in my in my article <laughs> okay there's a chat question yeah I uh, just uh, want to ask uh, Professor, do, do we have the original copy, uh, original work of Arabic or? Uh, no, 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 mm -hmm. no, that, that, that's a fictional, uh, that's also fiction. So, mm -hmm. so Cervantes mm -hmm. invents that there, there was a, a copy, a copy in Arabic, but there was no such, such, such work. <laughs> So uh, do you think that it is, uh, that means there is no any, uh, it was, the, uh, that means we, didn't, we don't have at all uh, such a, a work, that means. Right, 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 right. So, so it's, if, a, it's a fiction of fiction. Aha, uh -huh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that, but as, as you can see, I mean, he didn't, uh, Cervantes didn't write much about, I don't know, Arabic, kind of novel, but he, he actually, you know, he used Italian novels, right? The, the novella type of novel and, and many of uh, uh, episodes are from Italian novella stories. Uh, he didn't copy, but you know, just a modification of Italian novella. But um, when he talks about how he was so against the picaresque novel, as you, some of you know, a picaresque novel the European picaresque novel originated in, in Spain, right? The La Sarilla de Tormes, the, that's in fifth, sixth, beginning of the 16th century. And, and then, you know, uh, uh, Cervantes you know, criticized the, the, the picaresque genre because it, it, especially when he went to a slave gallery, gallery and there are each slave can have his own picaresque novel and it's not sort of like moralistic it's it's like anybody can tell the story and something like that but i think at the same time he he's where he kind of knows about makama uh, novel tradition and and then in at least in united states we kind of very rarely you see this kind of uh, exchange or or kind of shared conference between arabist and, and Hispanist. So at least in Hispanic, uh, I mean, Cervantes critics, they, they know of uh, this kind of uh, Makama influence, but rarely they, it became the main topic. Whereas, uh, uh, you know, the Arabic uh, specialist, uh, especially like Columbia universities and other places, they talk about how Makama uh, novel tradition may have influenced uh, Don Quixote and other uh, like picaresque novels. So some sort of uh, uh, you know mutual recognition can be uh, 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 explored. I think. Thank you. Uh, I, I have a comment. I was thinking in a theoretical consequence of this conversation. Probably we can test the idea of the di uh, biological uh, novel by Bakhtin. Mm -hmm. 
uh, how can we represent a uh, dialogical novel with data visualization? And uh, if this visualization is different from a monological novel, if, it's a, mm -hmm. if, this, if there is a real difference between these two. Of course, this is something that we should explore, we could explore in the future because this is not, a, it's not part of your presentation. But I was thinking on how can we test the idea of dialogical novel with data visualization? Yeah. Excellent, excellent, excellent idea. And, and kind of, I, I can learn much about it, but you know, I'm sure uh, people like you or Holly or other other uh, more energetic and, and bright people, not like me, old old guard here, <laughs> can do that much. But yes, I think uh, you know, even even when we look at. Uh, Closely, the narratological studies, especially Mickey Bell, Mickey Bell and others, who has done you know the uh, very kind of structured uh, uh, study of uh, narratology, right? So, so not only like voice, but time and space, and then also like uh, like Jeanette Gerald's uh, idea about the the what is that uh, the the temporal movement. So, like a uh, character think about uh, talk in the present, but remembers the past or uh, talk about the future. So all these can be carefully codified and then we can study about, about that. Uh, I, I think, you know, they themselves use very kind of, you know, uh, scientific or data kind of way, but didn't use data, but they, they wrote it in a, in a, in a, in a uh, the, the humanistic or literary way. But I think we can take, take that part and think about it and how we can identify the narrative time and narrative space, and then, and, and then um, yeah, that way we can identify some patterns and the different type of voices. And then, if we include all these, you know, uh, detailed uh, data, then we can kind of understand a little bit better the, how uh, polyphonic or dialogic uh, interaction uh, can happen in in. In, no, in novels, but I, but I think Daniel these days I more and more I see uh, movies or even you know webtoons or, or fiction and novels. I think these days people really uh, writers pay really close attention to almost like each character. So compared to uh, previous uh, centuries, I mean 20th century or even 19th century, the character developments uh, of uh, in in uh, contemporary novel is far more uh, 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 extensive and then uh, 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 you know uh, sophisticated than before. So I think this type of uh, you know uh, the dialectic interaction or the dialectic uh, dialectics can can be worked out uh, and and then we should learn how to codify them carefully. So uh, I guess uh, you know. Uh, First, we get, we better take a look at uh, uh, Mickey Bowles or other uh, narratology uh, experts' work and how we can come up with different codification of their 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 class their categories. Thank you. So. Thank you so much, Professor Noah, for your presentation. Um,